Hello and welcome to another episode of Risky Business. Uh, last time, uh, we couldn't figure out the board ID and we went on to studying GPIO, but uh, Megan has some more suggestions about um, board ID, so I think we're going to go back to that today. Uh, she asked if we can print out the rest of the OTP contents to see if they match what we expect from the High Five One Getting Started Guide, and we definitely can do that. And then she also says, also make sure your clock isn't running too fast when you're trying to read the OTP contents. You'll need to set the OTP divider properly if your clock is running at the 256 MHz level. So we haven't messed with um, setting the OTP divider or messing with the, the clock speed. Uh, she also mentioned <coughs> that um, regarding the uh, busy loop in the init for the UART to settle. Uh, she says, that makes sense. The shorter loop was for a 16 megahertz clock frequency. If you are adding this to your code after you bump the frequency, you'd likely need a longer delay. Well, we didn't bump any clock frequencies. So I don't really know what's up with that, but that might explain if our clock is running faster than we expect. Um, that would also explain why we might be getting bad reads from the OTP. So we're going to start off, I think, by just printing the OTP contents. So if we go back to the Getting Started guide, and we find the OTP contents, We see that um, the OTP is 32-bit um, aligned for reads. So we're going to print a bunch of integers. And I think we want to print from um, this offset to this offset right here. And we can see uh, a variety of example values. So like with a uh, zero offset, we expect 7F50106F, which is uh, the assembly instruction J0X1FF4. And various things of that nature. So uh, let's begin. Um, so we're going to print I'll start it at um, this address here, which is the beginning of the OTP. And then we're going to that plus 1FFC. So we're going to do a loop. And we're going to say while board ID is less than or we'll say less than or equal to 0x. And I know I'm comparing a pointer to an integer. I suppose we could cast it, but I don't really care. 21ffc should be the address, right? And all we want to do in that loop is print the board ID and um, the contents of it. And then we need to increment it as well. So 
So really, I guess this could be a for loop. Let's make it a for loop. So we're going to have an end pointer and um, I'll just call it P and we're going to say that is going to be that value there and then we want to loop until we hit this value and we want to increment the ID each loop and because it's an in pointer uh, that'll move it for in terms of the address And then I'm just going to print the board ID and the value in hex. So I think that should be good. So I'll do a make software clean, make software. All right, what do we have here? Oh, it's not called board ID anymore, it's called P. Try that upload again. All right, there we go. Now let's look at these values here. Uh, it looks like we got cut off from my, as far back as my history scroll back goes. Uh, there's a lot of zeros in there, so we might want to be a little bit more selective in what we're printing. So let's look down here at what we've got. So T1FFC should be uh, 0002805 zero, 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 so 28057 uh, we had 28061 so that is incorrect so that suggests strongly that we are the problem we're having is because we are reading uh, incorrectly because that value should be exactly 28057 because it's an instruction JRT0 and then what's the one before it 
So this is 200002B7, which is uh, LUI T00X, and then um, the address of the start of the OTP. And, <clears throat> and again, you can see uh, 2B5 instead of 2B7. Let's keep looking here. So the one up from that is just F, and that's the fence. And I think we do have that one correct. Indeed we do. Um, FF0, we have one, and FEC, we have nine. So let's take a look at those. Uh, yes, this one is supposed to be 1. FEC varies. That's the HFRO's SC trim setting. But we can't trust the value we're getting regardless of what it is. Um, then FE8, we have a 0. Uh, that's correct. Uh, FE4 is where the board ID is supposed to be. And we're getting an in incorrect value there. And then we have a bunch of zeros. And that would be up to um, 0, 0, 0, 4. So really, all we want to print is 1FE4 to 1FFC, and we want to print um, 0, 0, 0, 0 as well. So let's change up the code a little bit. So 1FE4 is where we want to start. And then I'm going to do one more print. And it is going to be 0x200000. Zero 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 zero. And then I'm just going to cast that to an int pointer. So that'll give us the um, the first value, and then these are the other values we care about in this loop. All right, and again, you can see this is not the correct value. We got 655-0006D. And the correct value is 7F50106F. So that is definitely wrong. So, I mean, we're definitely right in the locations that we're printing, right? Because we saw the zeros are in the right places. This value is correct. Um, I think this value is correct. I don't know about this one. This one's correct. This one is um, off, but, you know, it's kind of in the range of what we're looking for. This one's off, but it's kind of in the range. These two down here are like really close. They're not exactly right, but they're like just a little bit off. So we're looking in the right place. We're just reading incorrectly. And that probably has to do 
with um, the clock frequency. So I think the problem is that my board is running too fast, uh, running faster than we expect it to. Uh, because that explains both of my problems. It explains why I need a larger than normal um, busy loop in the UART init. And it also explains why um, reading values from the OTP fail. So first of all, I'm going to report this on the forums. Uh, let's quote this. Now, how do we want to format this? Should I make it a quote? Uh, Pre-formatted text. Sure. So it looks like um, we are looking in the right place, but the values are off. Um, I haven't messed with the clock frequency of my board at all. Uh, but perhaps it is running faster than expected. I will look into setting the OTP divider today. All right, now. So I mean, like if you look at the car frequency that's printed from my board, um, this is like 267 megahertz. And she mentioned 256 megahertz. Uh, I know this car frequency isn't completely stable. It does vary between runs, but it's generally in this sort of range. Um, and that would be faster than 256 megahertz. So I don't know what's up with that. Um, so let me see here. We want to know about setting the OTP divider thing. So let's see if we can find information about the OTP. It uh, doesn't look like there's anything about the OTP in this document, unless I missed it. 
let's check this one. Okay, chapter 14 is all about the OTP. And then before we read that, let's check this uh, manual as well. Okay, there's a mention to OTP in chapter 5 of this. So the OTP is located on the peripheral bus with both a control register interface to program the OTP and a memory read part interface to fetch words from the OTP. Instruction fetches from the OTP memory read part are cached in the E3 one car's instruction cache. The OTP needs to be programmed before use and can only be programmed by code running on the E31 car. The OTP bits contain all zeros prior to programming. Now let's read chapter 14 of this document. This chapter describes the operation of the one-time programmable memory controller on sci-fi systems. Device configuration and power supply control is principally under software control. The controller is reset to a state that allows memory mapped reads under, under the assumption that the controller's clock rate is between 1 MHz and 37 MHz. So, um, I don't know if we're talking about the core frequency there, but if we're talking about the core frequency, then we're way out of that range. We're way faster than 1 to 37 megahertz. Um, maybe they're talking about a different clock rate. I don't know. Like, I know there's the real-time clock, but I don't think they'd be talking about that. Um... But yeah, it, I'm pretty sure the problem we're having must be because we're higher than the 37 megahertz top end of this range. <clears throat> uh, excuse me, under this range of um, what the OTP expects for a reading. So VRREN is asserted during synchronous reset. It is safe to read from OTP immediately after reset if reset if reset is asserted for at least question mark question mark question mark um uh microseconds that's a a mu I'm pretty sure that's a micro right while the controller's clock is running. Programmed I.O. reads and writes are sequenced entirely by software. Memory map. The memory map for the OTP control registers is shown in table 14.1. Let's take a look at that. Okay, so These are sci fi OTP register offsets. Only naturally aligned 32 bit memory accesses are supported. So this just says address up here instead of offset, but it says in the description of the table uh, register offsets. Uh, and this is assembly example they have right here, which is apparently sequence to acquire and release OTP lock. They just refer to it as a symbol. So I don't know if the assembly takes care of that for you 
or if they assume you have defined this. Uh, I'm not sure about that. But we see the names for each of these. Uh, there's a programmed I.O. lock register, an OTP device clock signal, and that might be relevant to us, uh, OTP device output enable signal, uh, device chip select signal, device write enable signal, device mode register, read voltage regulator control, write voltage charge pump control, read voltage enable, write voltage enable, device address, device data input, device data output, and read sequence controller. So the one that stood out to me there is the clock signal. Uh, there's also stuff dealing with voltage. I wonder if um, the uh, jumper being in one of the positions, they use 5 volts or 3.3 volts. I wonder if that matters for this. I'm not totally sure what that matters for because um, I had it in 5 vol volts for a while and it seemed to be working. And I have it in 3.3 volts now, and I don't notice a difference. So I don't know exactly what that affects. Um, but it might matter for this. I don't know. Uh, I want to look at the getting started guide again. Because I'm pretty sure that mentioned the jumper. The IORF jumper. So that's for selecting the IO reference voltage. Um, is there any other information about the IORF jumper? So it's to select the IO reference level. Depending on the shields you want to drive, you select 3.3 or 5. Well, we're not driving any shields right now, so uh, it doesn't matter to us in that regard. So you must install the jumper on one side or the other in order to drive or read any signals on the IL header. So I doubt this matters for the OTP. I don't think that should matter for anything other than like external stuff like shields The USB interface provides a 5 volt power source to the board. But uh, again, I don't think that matters for the IORF jumper. So let's go back to reading about the OTP. So programmed I.O. reads and writes are sequenced entirely by software. Um, we looked at that table. The control register memory map has been designed to only require naturally aligned 32-bit memory accesses. The OTP controller also contains a read sequencer, which exposes the OTP's contents to, as a read slash execute only memory map device. 
So when we're reading from these addresses, where um, the addresses are memory mapped, and we're actually going through a read sequencer um, on the OTP controller. So programmed I.O. lock register. The OTP lock register supports synchronization between the read sequencer and the programmed I.O. interface. When the lock is clear, memory mapped reads may proceed. When the lock is set, memory mapped reads do not access the OTP device and instead return zero immediately. So uh, we know the lock is clear because if the lock was set, uh, we'd just be getting zeros for everything we're reading. And we're not getting zeros, we're getting values. So we know that much. So the OTP lock should be acquired before writing to any other control register. So um, Um, Megan said, uh, we might need to set the OTP divider properly. So I believe setting the OTP divider would involve, um, writing to one of these control registers. And if we're writing to one of the control registers, uh, then we need to acquire a lock first, uh, because it says... Uh, where did it say that? The OTP lock should be acquired before writing to any other control register. So I think what we need to do is acquire a lock uh, with the OTP lock, uh, write to a control register, and then release the lock. And that should be the sequence to um, to set that OTP divider she's talking about, I think. Uh, she also replied, uh, you can also try using the LED fade demo as your starting point, as it uses the um, the no init flag, but still sets up the clock source to be 16 megahertz and configures the UART appropriately within the code. Okay, so we should try this from the LED uh, fade demo. So by default, without the no init defined, the Freedom e SDK initializes code, uh, initialization code will switch you over to the PLL and 267 megahertz is way too fast to read the OTP without setting the OTP clock divider. Okay, so um, the Freedom E SDK initialization code is what's setting us to the 267 megahertz. And uh, it's doing that with PLL, apparently. I don't know what that means yet. Uh, I know what it, what it means in terms of Rubik's cubes. <laughs> uh, PLL is um, a sequence of algorithms for doing the last layer. But uh, that is definitely not what's being referred to here. So uh, before we look into this deeper, we might want to try that. Uh, we're kind of in the middle of reading this now, though. So I think we should at least read the rest about the OTP. Um, and then after that, we'll try her suggestion and see how that goes. So programmed I.O. lock register, that's what we're looking at. Um, so software can attempt to acquire the lock by storing one to OTP lock. Uh, if a memory mapped read is in progress, the lock will not be acquired and will return the value zero. So you need to do this in a loop is what that means, right? Uh, you try to set uh, one in OTP lock, and if it returns zero, you jump back and do it again 
until you get a one. And then once you successfully have a lock, um, you can write to other control registers. After a programmed I.O. sequence, software should restore the previous value of any control registers that were modified, then star zero to OTP lock. Okay, so you should um, get a lock, um, read, I guess it doesn't matter when you read, uh, you could read before the lock or after the lock, um, but you need to read <clears throat> the value of the control register you want to modify, store it somewhere. Uh, you acquire the lock if you haven't already. You write uh, to the register. You do the stuff you want to do, uh, which in our case is reading the OTP contents. Uh, and then you set the value back to what it was, and then you release the lock. And then it says you start zero to OTP lock to release it. And then 14.1 shows the synchronization code sequence. That was the assembly we saw. So you can see here's the loop where it's checking um, to make sure you get uh, a lock you can see here's where they're writing one to it, right? Um, and then um, they loop until they get the value, until they get it to return one. And then um, you do your your I/O, and then you um, zero out the um, the OTP lock. So that makes sense. Programmed I.O. sequencing. The programmed I.O. interface exposes the OTP devices and power supplies control signals directly to software. Software is responsible for respecting these signals set up and hold times. The OTP device requires that data be programmed one bit at a time and that, that the result be reread and retried according to a specific protocol. Uh, see the OTP device and power supply data sheets for timing constraints, control signal and descriptions, and the programming algorithm. So I believe we're talking here about actually writing the OTP and the power supply stuff, which isn't what we care about doing. Uh, we only need to set up the control registries so that we can read the OTP. Uh, read sequencer control register. So the read sequencer is what we're going through to read. Uh, the read sequencer consists of an address setup phase, a read pulse phase, and a read access phase. The duration of these phases in terms of controller clock cycles is set by a programmable clock divider. Okay, so here we're talking about the OTP divider that uh, Megan mentioned. The divider is controlled by the OTP RS control register. So that's the um, read sequencer control register we're talking about here. Uh, the layout of which is shown in figure 14.2. Here's the figure. So it looks like you've got 0 to 2 is scale, 3 is TAS, 4 is TRP, 5 is TRACC, whatever those are, and then 6 to 31 is reserved. So um, just a few things there in the, in the low end that we have. Most of it's just uh, reserved. So the number of clock cycles in each phase is given by 2 to the scale power. And the width of each phase may be optionally scaled by 3. 
That is, the number of controller clock cycles in the address setup phase is given by the expression 2 to the scale times 1 plus 2 TAS. The number of clock cycles in the read pulse phase is given by 2 to the scale times 1 plus 2 TRP. And the read access phase is 2 to the scale times 1 plus 2 uh, T. RACC. Okay, so we have a bunch of formulas here that depend on all these values. Uh, the reset value of scale is 1. Software should acquire the OTP lock prior to modifying this register. Uh, that makes sense because it's a control register. Uh, and that's everything in this document. So we could take notes on these different uh, formulas for uh, the scaling. I don't know if I want to do that right now though. I think I want to try what Megan suggested, suggested on the uh, forums, which is using the LED fade demo because it uses um, no in it. Uh, but it does set up the clock size to be 16 megahertz and configures the UART appropriately. So that is a good sanity test. That should be able to properly do our read. So like this right here is the um, the code that I want to do. Um, here, let me so let's go to the LED fade demo. So here we're defining some lower level uh, printing stuff. I wonder if we're still able to use uh, printf in this demo. I hope so. <laughs> okay, so that explains why the loop is as it is right here, because they set it to 16 megahertz. And you can see that right here, runoff 16 megahertz crystal for accuracy. Gotcha. Okay. So here is where they're printing. So I'm just going to paste my code in there. And I'm going to get rid of these. And we're going to hope that we can use printf in this demo. So yeah, let's give this a try and see what happens. So um, we want to make software clean. Uh, we want to make software. We're going to set program equal to LED, uh, it's called LED fade. Uh, let's check the warnings there. Okay, it warns that we have an Im implicit declaration of printf. We can probably include it though, right? Include stdio.h. Yep, 
Yeah, now the only warning we get is the comparison between pointer and integer. So let's make upload. And again, I'll pass the program name in. Uh, let's connect to it. And look at that. We've got some reasonable values. Okay, so let's compare these with what we expect to see. I can tell you right now that the timestamp looks correct. Uh, 5.8 is the right range of a Unix timestamp for the time we're looking for. Uh, where was that uh, OTP contents? Okay, 7F50106F. And that one's correct. Um, the next one we want to look at is uh, 1FV4, which is our timestamp. So let's put that in. So Unix timestamp. Are you guys excited? I know I'm excited. We're going to get to see when this thing was burnt. All right, it was 20th December 2016. That is that is a value I can believe. So that is awesome. Okay, I I need to report this on the forums. Um let's see here. So I want to quote, uh, let's just quote all of it. Okay. So, now we've got that figured out. That's pretty awesome. So, a uh, lesson here is that the OTP needs to be read either at 16 megahertz or by using the clock divider or possibly both because um, like the speed we were running at is way too high. So yeah, let's look at these other values to make sure they're all correct. So we've got a zero. Um, I believe that one's correct. Yep. Um, 1FEC varies, so let's see what value we've got there. That one's the 9 that we saw before. Uh, we know the 1 and the F are correct. Um, right, you can see right here, 1 and F. And then um, this one should be 2B7 on the end, which it is. And then this one should be 28067. And, oh, this one is 28057. So it did fail to properly read 21FFC. Unless the documentation is uh, got a typo in it. But I don't know. 
I am inclined to bet that this is off. So we maybe can't fully trust the um, the values we got here. Seven F five zero one oh six six F. So that one was correct. The only one that was off is um zero X one F F C. So I'm going to report these values on the forums and see what Megan has to say about the one that's wrong. So should I do an edit or just a double post? Uh, I know on most forums double posting is discouraged uh, unless it's like a um, uh, an email based um, like mailing list type thing but Megan did a double post right here so I'm gonna hold that as a precedent and uh, do a double post <laughs> okay so the values I got from the OTP were Um, I'm going to say all the values look correct except for that last one. Shouldn't it be 28057? Wondering if the read wasn't perfect. All right, um, so what else should we do? I think I've still got five minutes today. Um, so I guess we could take some notes about the OTP. Uh, we might want to mess around with the um, the dividers, the divider stuff with the clock, since we read all about that. Uh, let me see here. Okay, so. I'm just going to give GPIO some space here. Well, actually, I mean, we read everything there was about GPIO, right? And this was the only note we took. So I won't give it too much space. Um, let's zoom in a little bit. I think this is the same uh, zoom level I was here, but you can see I was writing smaller over here, so I'm going to zoom in. And let's give it a little bit of space and say OTP. So 
so uh, read sequence control register. Um, the read sequence consists of three phases. So let's note down the three phases. So read sequence. Uh, we're going to say um, one is address setup. Two is read pulse. And three is read access. Okay, now, um, number of each clock cycles in each phase. Uh, two to the scale power. And it says the width of each phase may be optionally scaled by three. Okay, so clock cycles in the, so we're going to say in clock cycles per phase, so Uh, that is given by two scale times one plus two TAS. And then we're going to say Read pulse is to scale one plus two, and what's this one? Uh, two RS or RP? Yeah, uh, T RP. That's pretty unreadable, but uh. Good enough. And then um, read access to scale one plus two. And it's not just RA, I remember that. It's uh, a little bit more complicated for this one. RACC is what they call it. And then while we're at it, let's take notes of the um, lock sequence as well. So 
So uh, let's see here. Where was that? So the code is LA I should do this in a split, I think. LA T zero OTP lock ally t1 1 loop sw t1 t0 lw t2 zero and then we have the branch B equal zero T two loop so that says if uh, T2 is equal to zero loop uh, so uh, that's a jump right that's an address that it jumps to so it branches back to uh, this instruction right here, and that's how it does the loop. And then, um, what else do we have here? Um, so I'm gonna say save registers you want to modify programs IO restore registers And then we do uh, SW X zero T zero. So there is our lock sequence. And I think that's everything I want to co cover today. So thank you everyone who tuned in today. And uh, thank you everyone who watches on the YouTube archive, which is available at risky.tv. And you can follow me on Twitter at HMN underscore risky to get updates about the series. I will see you next time and stay risky everyone.